This show is about promises of freedom. And I'm not an academia. I can't tell you about the brush strokes, the blending of color and styles and things like that. But I can tell you about what these pieces mean to me. My selection process, I think every person that gets involved in the art, their attention will be drawn to what's important to them. In this particular case, what really draws me to these to the different pieces is there has to be a message. I think what has happened over time or back in time, because the majority of the artists here are not living now, but they had something to say. They had something to say to a loved one, a community, and maybe even the world. They were not singers, they were not musicians or poets or book writers, but what they do do, they communicate through their art. And they leave it up to us so many times to look at a piece and for us to get the story. I've had several opportunities where I've had an opportunity to sit with an artist and I will ask him, you know, what were you thinking when you uh, painted this piece? And they, I have never gotten an answer from either one. None of them. They always say, what do you see? <laughs> and they sort of leave us out there. Well, I'm going to try not to do I can tell you what I see in these pieces. But I will sort of give you a suggestion. Anytime you look at a piece of art, try to find that story. And sometimes that story will become even more important if you do a little research afterwards and you find out the backstory, because the backstory will add even more importance. Now, I think you said something about someone's here with the Cold Scott. I would definitely like to talk to you because to me, Cold Scott was one of the better storytellers. When you get into Jacob Lawrence, you will see one or two pieces here from Jacob Lawrence, but to me, he was the ultimate storyteller. If you go through his Toussaint L'Ouverture series, it just told a story about Toussaint L'Ouverture. The John Brown series, the Genesis series, they're all great storytellers. Robert Cole Scott, a great storyteller. Now, some of the pieces here will just be one particular message that they have to all of us. And the message to me might be different you know, a different message to you or someone else. But there is definitely a message in it. Some of the guys and some of the ladies here, they will be bold and outspoken. Some will be very soft and serene. Some people, will ch they are very loud, and they will paint that way. The others will be very, like I say, soft, very sincere. They'll be very soft-spoken, but they will have a great, great message to give to you. Now, we've picked about 20 pieces that we're going to show you on the screen. They are not pieces that are in the show, but I just wanted to give you some idea with these pieces as to what I see. So when you transfer to the actual gallery, you'll be able to look at the pieces and maybe figure out that story. Now, like I say, I, I collect the social pieces. Now, if it's not a message, I will generally shy away from a piece, but I'm always looking for something to talk, talk about. I want it to talk to me. Uh, majority of the pieces are pieces from, uh, they were produced by Afro-Americans. Not all of the pieces are produced by Afro-Americans, Afro but majority of them are. And I can identify with that Afro-American story because that's who I am. And I think that message has been lost so this is my contribution to them to let their message get out and go to a lot of people. Now, as we're going, if you have some questions, don't be afraid to stop me because I love to get, you know, engage in some discussion about the different pieces. Does anybody have any questions before we start? Because I probably have missed something. I, I didn't come up here with a prepared speech. I've got a couple of little things that I do want to say and I think I have said them. But uh, we will go through the uh, first piece. The first piece will be from Curtis James. Curtis James was born in Albany, Georgia. He now lives and works out of New York. But Curtis is a very shy guy. 
He doesn't speak, but he paints about, I guess, his life and when he was growing up in Albany, Georgia. He paints the people that were in his neighborhood, friends of his mother and, and his father. But uh, it's called Madea, and Mother Dear, and it's actually his mother. And uh, I, I, was, I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the rural part of Tulsa. So the pieces will sort of, they, it identified with me. My mother always had a garden, They're always standing out on a fence or something like that, talking to someone. But you get the big, bold colors, you know, late in her life. You, you can see the hard work. The sun is taking a toll on her skin and everything else. But there's an expression, that's a story in it. Her eyes are closed. But there is a definite story that a lot of people probably can identify with there. The second piece, and they just, the second and third piece, are just Haitian wood pieces. The Haitian community was a very artistic community, and they are, uh, they are wood sculptures. And uh, you'll see uh, one's the instrument player. And this does not do the piece justice because it's dark but it's all made out of one piece of wood. So the artistic value is definitely there. The second uh, piece is a man going to gather water. This, uh, the lighting is a lot better on that, but if you look at the details, everyone knows the story of the Haitians. So you can see the wear and tear in his clothes, the struggle, but still a very proud person. He has his head, head up, but you, if you look at the detail, you can't see the muscles, but the muscles are in his back. You can see them in his arm. And the piece is correct as far as the dimensions and things of that nature. But it's a great, great piece. Now, I'm going to come to two pieces I really like to talk about. And this uh, guy's name is Tafa. He's an African. He works out of New York. Upcoming, I would imagine Tafa's about 40. but he really is a social messenger. The first piece is called Welfare Mom. He did the piece in 2002, and it's so relevant now. And what you will see is the, the different hand, colors of the hand, different ethnic groups, and he's talking about what government does for the people. A couple of pennies that fall out of the sky, that's the government's contribution to the different ethnic groups of the poor. Then you go to the next piece is called corporate welfare. And that's a discussion right now that we're having. Like, and art has been my history lesson. And it's a funny thing how history sort of repeats itself. This is a good example of how history repeats itself. When you go to corporate welfare, then you see the guys in the suits and the ties and the dollars falling from the sky in multitude. But, Going to the, the sixth piece, and what I like about this, it's just a piece out of the, the western portion of Africa. It's, I think it was from Cameroon, but it's just an, uh, it's a stone that they, that's only in Africa. But if you look at the details, the lips, the earrings, the braids in the hair, very artistically done, but a very powerful, powerful piece. And, and the reason I say it's uh, artistically done for a long time, a lot of people thought that the Africans did not produce great art. This is an example of the great art that they did produce. And later on, we'll get to a piece. Uh, you, yes? Can you tell us about how large these sculptures are that you have? This piece is about 18 inches high, maybe 13 or 14 inches well, no, it's about nine or ten inches wide. Might be a little bit larger than that. Let me see if I have it down here. Be my luck, I don't. Yes, it's 18 by 11. It's 18 by 11. Okay, uh, the two wood pieces. Uh, this piece, uh, let me see if I can read it. It's 24 by 18. But it's a nice piece, yeah. It's got, it has good size. The uh, piece before that is uh, 42 by 12. Yeah, but, but they're nice pieces. They're, they're very nice pieces. Mm. 
This is called retired, another Curtis James piece. And if uh, you live or you work in a rural area and your parents uh, worked during that time when there was a lot of farming or anything like that was going on, this piece actually reminded me of my father. That's what drew me to this particular piece. And like I say, it's the back stories. It's almost an identical piece of my, of my uh, uh, the identical image of my father. Matter of fact, when my brother walked into the house to see it, he actually asked me the question, when, when did you get the old man to sit for a piece? <laughs> I said, that's, that's not him, man. That's just something that Curtis did. But it's called retired. And the reason it related to me, my father had an old Chevrolet truck just like that. And he used to always sit out in the yard in the latter part of his life, sit under the shade tree with his little hat there and fall asleep. So that's what drew me to that particular piece. But the artwork has to relate to you. If you have or you, if you want to possess a piece or you gather some different pieces of art, you're going to have to look at it every day of your life. So you better, you know, you want to make sure that you appreciate it because every day that you walk through your house, you're going to see it. So Benny Andrews, it's just, it's just, a, just a little fun piece, you know. He's a hunter. My father was an avid hunter. It, the name of the piece is Sikkim. <laughs> but just a fun piece. But everybody knows, or knows Benny Andrews' reputation. A great, you know, just a great artist. Great, great artist. Now we go to the, a piece of Benin bronze. And the story on this piece is when the British first went to the kingdom of Benin, they were under the impression that it was just a little country. They had no possessions that they wanted. And they never thought these people could produce anything. After they got there, they found that uh, they were a lot further along than the rest of civilization. If you look, and what this piece is depicting, that's the Oba, or that's the king. This is his high, one of his high priests. This is the other high priest. Two of his uh, village people, and these are British soldiers, and they're taking the Oba off the king. To control the people, they had to depose of the doggone king or Oba. They took him off the doggone island. Naturally, they killed him. And then they came back, and they took all the riches, riches from the island. The, the fun thing about this piece is that the people were not allowed to talk about it or to do anything. It was uh, like maybe 60, 65 years ago that they first started producing artwork that gave you a history on what happened when the British came to the island. But it's, let me go back a little bit further. This piece, really, I, I don't know who the artist is, but I walked into a gallery in Houston, Texas one day, and just her physical characteristics, it, it just drew me to it. It's a very, very powerful piece. It's made out of iron wood. The piece, well, you know what, you, let me see if I have the dimensions of that piece. That piece is 34 inches by 17 inches, but it's over 300 pounds. It took uh, really three of us to move it. And just to, uh, to imagine how do they handle that piece, and it's all one piece of wood. But it just shows you the artistic talents of some of the African tribes. But it's a great... There is a group of Africans that work out of uh, New Jersey, and they are constantly bringing, they will work the back villages and things like that, and they find interesting pieces of art. And they sort of move around the United States, and they service all the galleries for African art. Yep. But that's where she got it from. Do you have any idea where this is from? I don't. But I don't. I have not. 
you know, I've had the piece less than a year and I haven't had the opportunity to really sit down and work on the history of the piece. It's just that I like the piece, so I try to show it as much as possible. But maybe, you know, if I come back through here in a year and we're talking, I might be able to give you the history on that piece, because I will talk to him. Robert Cole Scott. Where's the lady that's uh, doing the study on Cole Scott? Can I ask you to tell me about this piece? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Uh huh. Okay. This is my interpretation. It's pretty accurate. I'm not going to say it's accurate to the, the smallest detail, but the, the piece is out of a series that Cole Scott did entitled Knowledge of the Past is a Key to the Future. Like I say, it's always a, so, a social message in everything that I collect. Knowledge of the past is the key to the future. It's the series. The title of this piece is General Gordon Romancing the Nile. And it's really talking about General Gordon during the slavery times. General Gordon is actually a real person out of history. And he uh, commanded some slave ships. If you look him up, you'll find that he was real. But of all the brutal... I guess, transport of the slave, and he was brutal too. They said he was one of the most caring people. And if you walk through the piece, you will see, like I say, there's a story here, and you have to read the story. Uh, that's General Gordon. You see the, the female slave, and he's romancing the female slave. All at the same time, he has a male slave bound with a noose around his neck, and if you really get into it, if you come to the right, bottom right, the piece, those represent a uh, slave in the bottom of a slave ship. You go to the bottom left, you see the blacks at the feet of this person. This person represents Jesus Christ. And it's almost like he's speaking to Jesus and he's saying, hey, Jesus, do you see what's going on here? What are you going to do? Are you going to continue to allow that to happen? You go up here, and there were naturally resistance in, uh, to the slave trade. So when they found some of the people that were exporting their people, they put them to the sword. Then you go to the top left, there were, Afri and there were Africans that was complicit in the slave trade. He's getting his gold. And then you go here, the, this lady represents the Queen of England. She's pompous. But all the evil that's going on around her, her eyes are closed. If you look at her eyes, are, it's are closed. And what she's saying is, hey, I don't see this. I know nothing about it. But Cole Scott, he dealt in satire. But he told a story in each and every one of his pieces. And when you go out into the show, He's got two pieces out there. One in particular called, it's from this same series, but the uh, piece is Tobacco, the Holdouts. And it talks about the evils of tobacco, and no matter what we have been educated on about tobacco, people of all races, all doggone economic levels, we still participate. Can I ask you what you make of the um, eyes of the very Ah, I'm glad you said that. I forgot that. Uh, 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 the eyes are what Cole Scott is saying, and you will find that in a lot of his pieces. What he's saying is, no matter what we do, good, evil, we think we're doing it and nobody knows and we can get away with it. What he's saying, there's always someone watching that they can tell the true story that's what's going on here. And you'll see it in just about all of, his all of his pieces that you will have those eyes and they're always watching you. No matter what you do, you see, and you can't get away with anything. There's someone that will know what's happening here. This is Taffa, the guy in New York. It's an abstract artist. For a long time, I couldn't understand abstract art. And then I finally had a guy to explain it. This is not a 
picture where you can really good, get a good example, but you'll see all the little small brush strokes. I'm going to imagine that you have picked it out, but what this, the name of the piece is called uh, Prison Riot. And what it is, it's the chaos in a prison yard. So all the different colors represent some malaise that's happening on the a prison yard, and all those are people. And I wish I had the piece here because when you are up close, you don't see nothing but little bitty paint strokes. But when you back off from the piece, it comes alive and it represents the different people. It represents a whole conglomerate of people. The doggone circles are telescopic sights off of rifles, off the guard's rifles. But it's always a story in all the pieces. Abstract is some of the artwork that I have the most difficult time in interpreting. Uh, some people, I mean, they see it, uh, it takes a minute. Uh oh. This is another Taffa piece. And I don't know if you can read all the name. It's called Terrorists and Freedom Fighters. And what he's saying is, depending on what side of the political football you're on, you're on some of those names will represent terrorists. Some of them will represent freedom fighters. Or uh, they'll re represent freedom fighters to a certain group of people. They'll represent terrorists to another group of people. And what he's saying is, you know, open up your eyes and just look. I don't know if I have, he has another piece. I don't know if I had Mike to include it. It's not here. Boy, wow. And it's called Upside Down Jesus. And he talks about, and when he first did the piece, about three years ago, the New York Times just ate him alive because it's a piece with Jesus upside down and all the names of different terrorists down the side of the piece. And what he's saying is people are understand, misunderstanding Jesus. They're misunderstanding religion. They're fighting and killing people for all the wrong reasons. So what he said, they've turned the meaning and the purpose of Jesus Christ upside down. And when are we going to write this and understand what Christ is really trying to preach to us? And he's, saying, he's really saying, hey, we missed it. Same thing he's saying in here. We missed it. We're fighting. We're all fighting one thing, but for different causes. But Taffa is one of the younger guys that I really, I like his social messaging. This is uh, Reed, Ed Reed, and it's a rapture. I was drawn to the piece because uh, I guess a little small part of the backstory. This is, you look at the piece and it's sort of demonic. And that's what I thought. And then when I got into his history, in the latter part of his life, he went insane and he uh, was in a mental institution for the rest of his life, and that's where he passed. And he did that during the period in his life where he did go insane. But it's called the rapture. You see the, oops, wrong, wrong one. You see the people that are not caught up in the light. You see the melting bodies and what was going on. But it makes me wonder. When an artist is doing something, what is really going through their head? And what message are they really trying to communicate to us? But ultimately, even if we disagree with the pieces, they had a message. And myself, I think, I, tr I, I try to pass that message on and let each, every, each and every one of us determine what that message is and if we can relate to it. But there's a message. And if you really get into the pieces, you'll also appreciate the artistic value. You can tell each and every one of these guys are very talented artists. Can I ask a question? Sure. What, what do you think that building is? What do you think that setting? That's a pool hall. Okay. That's a pool hall. Yeah, that's, those are pools. That's those pool sticks in their hand, the stools around the room. Yeah, but it's a pool hall, and it's a pool table right there. Ed Clark, when we first started talking, and we were talking about some artists are very bold and in your face. To me, Ed Clark sort of does it two ways. He's bold, 
but he's very serene. That he paints with a big wide brush. Of how big is that painting? That's about twelve foot by five foot. Well, let me look it up. Let me look it up. It is. Da, 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 da. Yes, it is. It's about it's seven foot by twelve foot. Yeah, it's a big piece. It's a nice, nice piece. So. Yeah, but you get the power in it. You get the serenity in it. It's almost like there's a storm going on, but it still has a calming effect to myself. Now, it might mean a little bit something else to you. Uh, that's called The Wave. Ed Clark, The Wave. This title, this is Ed Clark again. It's called Louisiana Red. And the storms that go on in Louisiana, you see the white portion. It's probably the calm part of it. This is the storm. This is the dark part of it. But it's called Louisiana Red. But he was uh, sort of a quiet painter, in, in my opinion. And a lot, loud and bold, but very quiet. Yes, ma'am? What was the surface that he paints on? Just canvas? It's canvas. Is it's it also vintage? It's, yes. As a matter of fact, it's, uh, hmm, what is it? At one time, I used to know all those by heart, but the inventory has gotten large. It's 67 inches by 71 inches. So what is that? A little over about five and a half foot by, yeah. But it's a nice size piece. What is he painting and what's the medium? It's acrylic and it's on canvas. And he does it with a big broad broom. Well, the few artists that I've seen do that. I've seen some Russian artists and German artists that painted with a broom, and I think he was one of the first ones that I brought to bring it to the United States. Richard Mayhew, very quiet, very serene, and he does, and he's a landscape artist, but he, he thought, uh, he doesn't give you any detail and the name of this piece is, this is an Italian piece, Montago. But he uh, traveled, uh, you know, the world, and he always painted different scenes early in the morning. It's actually all, all on canvas. And it's a fairly large piece. It's 48 by 60 inches. But Mayhew, you see the trees, but he never does give you the fine, fine detail but he still allows you to get the message. I call, I call him an almost figurative abstract, but you can tell what the figure is, but you still get the abstraction there. Same thing here. The title of that piece is, well, I can't read it. It's too small. <laughs> That's odd. Ritual, but it's always trees. It's always a landscape. There's always a pond in it. There's always a meadow in it with the different colors. It's probably spring, but uh, he was a very he's sort of a, a quiet loner type guy. So none of his messaging is very bold or anything of that nature. Majority of them are not living. Mayhew's 85. He's still living. I've uh, had an opportunity to talk to him two or three times. Curtis James uh, is in his 40s. Toffer's in his 40s. Who else did I have here? I would say 20, 25% of the time of the new artists that I uh, meet, uh, I get an opportunity to talk to them. I sort of try to duck around that word, uh, collect. This is a collection. I am not a collector. And the reason I don't like the word collector, the word collector to me tells that it tells or communicates that I'm the owner of a piece of art. I'm not the owner. I'm the guardian. I have it. The artist 
they have a message that everybody would love to hear, or a message that they would like to give, get out. So by showing the art, by you coming here, and you know, being gracious with your time, they get an opportunity to give you their message. So I don't look at myself as a collector, so you'll see me stumbling around that word all the time. But I, because the art is for the people, and it should be shown. I don't like to see the guys that own a lot of art, they lock it up in their house and they never share it with the world. Because that artist did not mean for it to be locked up. They wanted that art to be shared with other people. And that's just my philosophy on it. This, I like the boldness of it. It's just a, it's just a good painting. It has no real message. That is just a great, great painting by Boykin. It's a small piece, probably 12 or 14, but just a great, great painting. It's just, it adds some serenity to a room. If you put too many bold pieces in there, it'll confuse your head, so it brings about a calmness to a room. <laughs> this is a young guy. I have not met him, but I will meet him. Now, this is a large piece. It's uh, 7 foot by 12 foot. And he does, uh, uh, you know, the Western scene. It's called Bronco Busters. It's acrylic on canvas. But you know, if you, like you have the uh, Red Tail movie coming out now that's talking about the, uh, the, the airmen, the black airmen. Well, you had the Black Cowboys, too. So this is Bronco Buster, the Black Cowboy. But just, uh, but you look at his strokes. His strokes are bold. There's great balance in the color. And it sort of jumps out. It's not a flat painting. It sort of jumps out to you. You can almost see the doggone movement in the piece. That, that piece is, like I say, seven foot tall by 12 foot wide. Yeah, it's a tall piece. It's, it's a big piece, but it's a great piece. The next pieces are just, I uh, wanted to close out. There's a lot of history in the Afro-American uh, art community. This is a piece that really was in Golden State Life Insurance Collection in California. Probably one of the first uh, black insurance companies. They went bankrupt a couple of years ago. And the two pieces, it's, all, it's about the building of California and the involvement that black people had in the building of California. Golden State Life owners, they commissioned Hale Rootroof and, uh, who was it, Hale Rootroof and Charles Austin to paint these pieces. The pieces are roughly 12 foot high by 18 foot wide. They're still sitting there, but it's a documentary of the doggone uh, blacks and the development of California. You, and it goes from the oil to the gold rush time, all of that. But basically, that's it.